effectively, Jane, Jane is going to give you a, a, a view of how she has interpreted the presentations this morning before we go into the question panel. So um, I will share the screen with, with her now. And I think, Jane, you should get a request to um, take control. Okay. Come through. If not, I can do it. Yes, I think uh, I can, but um, I am not seeing any way to click on to the next slide. So if you could do that for me yeah, or somebody could Mike. do that for me, Mike, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I'm ready to do that. OK, that's great. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, indeed to all the previous speakers. I've been listening absolutely fascinated um, by all that um, I've heard so far today. And I'd like to just pick up on a few key ideas and a few key words that have struck me in particular from uh, the presentations and from the very helpful um, discussions that each of the speakers has um, has generated today and I know there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, yes thanks to Mike for the introduction. I come actually from a family law background. I was uh, a barrister for 20 years before um, I changed to becoming a, a full-time mediator. Um, I trained way back in 1993 when the standards and regulations were very much in their infancy and where there was a little bit of, uh, well, quite a lot of infighting between the different um, professional bodies. And it's good to see that in, you know, as is true of all good mediation, that over time, um, the bodies have learned to uh, focus more on their uh, similarities and strengths than to emphasize their differences. And it's wonderful to hear from Robert, all the incredibly valuable a largely completely unpaid work that is going on at the Standards Board to help uh, us all along. Um, so Mike, if I could have the first slide, uh, please. Thank you. So the first key word that stands out for me, uh, looking at this both as mediator and uh, PPC at the Family Mediation Trust is the word training. And that covers uh, a huge range not just the training that we have as mediators, but the training that we are able to provide for those who perhaps don't know uh, much about uh, the mediation process, about how my arms work and about how we fit into the family mediation process. Um, we know that it's already possible for courts to divert cases out uh, to out of court uh, resolution processes like mediation. And we know that that's not being followed in very many courts. And that's partly down to, um, it's partly I think down to us as mediators to play as big a part as we can in offering to provide training for uh, local judiciary, magistrates, legal advisors, solicitors, CABs, and a plethora of other helpful and support agencies uh, and professionals about the work that we do. And as the Stephen Cobb said, it's really about the taking personal responsibility as mediators for developing those alliances and for uh, working out how we can best participate in the family hub of services that is available for our community in the areas that, they, that we're responsible for. And how by participating in those ways, we can be of the most benefit to those parents and children uh, who rely on us to try to help them to resolve their issues together. And that will require us uh, supporting the courts in the use of the cooperative parenting pathway so that where courts do get to the point where they um, will refer out a case for mediation, that the mediators are there ready, trained, and have a robust uh, professional uh, standard uh, standards board behind them so that the judiciary can be confident um, that the mediators they are referring cases to are the absolutely the best people for the job. And another sort of area in which um, you know, mediators can get fully involved is by participating in their local family justice board meetings. Um, we certainly participate both in the larger meetings and in the uh, smaller private law subcommittee meetings and do as much as we can to support the judicial process that way. 
So if we could just have the next slide, please, Mike. The next big word that really uh, struck me was that word triage. And that is so relevant, you know, to us as mediators and as PPCs um, in, in many, many different ways. The, the Family Solutions Group and all the wonderful work done by Helen Adam and her group has focused um, quite heavily on that need to, to look at how best we can triage family cases at the earliest possible stage. And that's whether or not they're going to end up in court. How can we best help those families along the pathway that they need to take? And it's clear that mediators are going to play uh, a crucial role in, in that triage process. We're not the only um, professionals and agencies involved in it. Um, but if there is to be some form of, I think what the report described as an early information and assessment meeting, which uh, would be attended by clients as soon as possible after separation, then mediators have a, a, a strong part to play uh, together with other suitably trained professionals. And we heard maybe that uh, Kafkas might be able to, um, you know, to participate in that work too, um, as a way to bring all that crucial information um, to parents at the earliest possible point before they become so entrenched in their dispute that the only way to think about resolving it uh, is through the court process. It was really heartening also to hear from Sir Stephen Cobb about the uh, initiative for the early uh, direction to the Separated Parents Information Programme or the SPIP as it's, as it's called. And it was, uh, I think I, I heard right when he said that as from next month, so June 2021, the gatekeeping judges in various courts will be empowered to direct people to attend the SPIP. And of course, that will be funded um, by, by the government. So it's uh, uh, the SPIP, as, as I know from having been a presenter for many, many years from 2008 onwards on the SPIP programmes, is a really rich resource of information and support, not just for parents who are going to consider going to court, but for any parents with uh, young children, dependent children, who are needing to sort out issues uh, between them. And I know that certain services, certainly the Family Mediation Trust is one of those, uh, make the SPIP available. Um, to people um, outside of the court process um, for a modest fee. And that is something that we routinely um, uh, direct um, our clients towards in suitable cases. It can be a wonderful resource and I do uh, commend it and urge people to make the best possible use of it. What we've heard is that from the court perspective, the MIAM should be really for people who are uh, who otherwise slip through that early triage net, that the MIAM should be the last chance saloon, I think the Family Solutions Group report describes it as, for parents thinking of making that application to the court. But nevertheless, it is still absolutely vital and useful step to try to catch those cases that have somehow slipped through the net um, earlier on, uh, and to divert them at every possible stage away from the court process and into an alternative way of resolving their disputes. It was also really interesting, I'm sorry, Mike, just before we go to the voice of the child, I've just um, noted down a few more things um, to do with triage, which popped out at me as the various speakers were, were speaking. Um, the first is that, that uh, Sir Stephen Cobb mentioned that unfortunately the Mayam is more often seen um, as an obstacle rather than an opportunity. And that is a real challenge for us, isn't it, as mediators, as to how we can turn that on its head. So that not only the um, clients who are using Mayams see them as an opportunity, but also that the judiciary and the, uh, all the agencies with whom we liaise and work see it as an opportunity too. And again, that's down to us as mediators to help promote that. 
I think the other thing that I noticed in terms of looking at triaging cases is um, uh, what Lisa uh, said, Lisa Hawker said, um, about the rise in complex cases. I know that anecdotally, when I speak to my colleagues uh, and supervisees and other um, trainers, um, that anecdotally we've noticed, particularly since lockdown, so in the last 12 to 18 months, a rise in the most challenging of cases, and largely those are coming from the areas of greater deprivation. And that is placing a huge demand uh, on the resources and abilities and skills of mediators to try to help those families to move through. So it's interesting to hear that from the data that is very much supported by, by, by the information that is being collected. Um, the other thing I wanted to pick up on in terms of triage was something that Tracy um, mentioned in her presentation and that um, it was really good to hear that she and her, her working group are looking at the possibility of an expedited route for consent orders that have been mediated in mediation, uh, an expedited route for those in appropriate cases to move through to the consent order process at court where parents need that reassurance perhaps of the authority of the court behind, behind that order. And um, I thought that the other interesting thing that came uh, from uh, Tracy Caldwell's um, uh, presentation along with many many other gems that she had was that point that at the start of the pandemic the legal advisors working in the courts um, were able to resolve at or before the first hearing 50% um, of the cases that they were dealing with and that makes me wonder whether if that was possible at the start of the pandemic um, because of that focus on the urgent need to triage cases and, and, and um, to try to avoid as much as possible a backlog, that what can be done to build on that experience that the legal advisors had at the start of the pandemic and to repeat perhaps some of the things that were being done there that led to that um, early resolution of cases. Thanks, Mike. I'm done with that slide now. So sorry, just a lot of other things sprang into my head as I've been listening this morning. So I will be going a little bit off piste from some of the slides uh, at points, but um, I won't run over time, Mike, don't worry. Um, I'll try not to anyway. Um, the voice of the child um, was something uh, very much which came to the fore in the Family Solutions Group report. Um, and it's interesting that um, although there's this focus on all children over the age of 10, having their opportunity to have that voice heard in the cases in which their welfare is at stake. Um, it's interesting that from Lisa's uh, analysis, the majority of cases coming to court concern a single child aged predominantly one between one and nine years old. And so in those cases, one has to rely mainly on, uh, on either the parents to report on the child's wish and, wishes and feelings, or in those cases that go to court, uh, where Kafkas do a wishes and feelings report uh, to rely on, on, on them for that. Um, and Mike pulled out some data um, from our own records that shows that uh, the of the cases that we've done in the last 12 months, those concern 911 children, of whom the average age is 7.3 years and only 23% are over the age of 11. Um, and so it's important, of course, that um, as mediators, we have that enhanced training to make sure that where we are seeing children of age 10 and above, that we have that training to see them. But um, what is worrying is that there are so many children that fall under that age. Um, and uh, in relation to whom we have to rely on other indirect sources to find out how they are feeling about things. Um, I won't go on about, uh, in interest of time, the challenges for mediators of uh, conducting child inclusive mediation cases online during the pandemic. Safe to say that um, of the ones I've done, I found that the children I was talking to were very much more adept at managing the technology than I was and that I was massively impressed by just how clearly the children that I've spoken to 
do see their parents' um, issues and how clear they were about the things that they wanted. So this is an area I have a particular interest in and it's probably the, the, the subject matter of a whole other training day. So uh, next slide, please, Mike. Um, the long-term aims of mediation um, must be, as Tracy so, um, so adeptly put it, uh, to try to avoid that I'll see you in court mentality um, and to try to um, help parents to uh, avoid, to help themselves to avoid using their children as pawns. Um, there is that huge emphasis in the research um, done over decades uh, now by the Roundtree Foundation and Nuffield Foundation uh, emphasising that it's not separation as such, as we all know, that uh, causes those adverse outcomes for children. It is the levels of conflict between parents that lead to, that, to those uh, difficulties for them. So the more that we can do um, as mediators to uh, help with the lowering of that conflict, to provide that message to clients, to signpost to the SPIP and to other helpful agencies, the better. Um, our aim always is to try to leave parents in a situation at the end of a mediation session where they can communicate uh, about their children on a practical level and at least treat each other with the very, at least a modicum of respect. Uh, if we've done that, then uh, it's been a good day's work. Um, next slide, please, Mike. Um, in terms of our self-regulation, as I mentioned before, it, uh, coming from Robert's uh, very comprehensive and helpful talk, it is vital that we all take personal responsibility as mediators and PPCs for our self-regulation. And I know that in the audience that I'm talking to now, that you're not the people that probably, um, you know, uh, uh, need to worry about that because you are already uh, hugely, um, uh, hugely, um, uh, emphasize the need for your own professional training and uh, ongoing support of our Family Mediation Standards Board. Um, we do as mediators, as we've said, need to earn that trust of the public and the judiciary. Um, and the challenges uh, of mediating and supervising mediators during the pandemic has absolutely brought to the fore how very important those professional standards are and how when our system is being tested to its absolute limits by the pandemic and all the consequences of that, um, that holding fast to our processes and our rules and regulations are what keeps us on track and what keeps us providing a really good high quality service for our clients. And then just onto the last slide, please, Mike, because I'm conscious we want to have some time for questions. Um, Mediators have adapted so incredibly quickly to the challenges of online working. And I'm really proud of all my colleagues at the Trust and nationally, all the training and all the webinars that have been um, promoted, often free by lots of uh, lots of organisations, have been an absolute, uh, you know, there's been an absolute wealth of uh, effort that has gone into providing training during this very difficult um, very difficult time. And thanks also to those people like Stephen Anderson who trained us uh, to do uh, online mediation and you know started to give us those skills and to managers like Mike who got behind us, provided us with the IT and the backup and support um, to, to do what we do so well. Um, the next challenge for us is going to be in supporting uh, you as mediators and PPCs to return to that in-person mediation process and uh, navigate those new COVID-19 safety requirements that we're all going to have to bear in mind. And it crossed the minds of myself and, and Adrian Wright, who's my co-PPC at the Trust here, that some new mediators may actually never have experienced in-person mediation before and that they're going to need to learn about Adrian's lovely word, the choreography um, of how to conduct and manage a meeting. So there are a lot of challenges, not just in managing the pandemic, but in managing how we come out of it. 
And one thing is absolutely clear, and that is that online mediation is here to stay. Um, and the exploration perhaps of a hybrid process between online face-to-face -face mediation is perhaps the next challenge for us to face. And on that note, I'm going to hand you back to Mike and um, um, I'm very thoroughly looking forward to, uh, to enjoying the rest of the day. Sorry, Jane. Um, thank you, Jane, for, for that. It's really helpful just to try and consolidate everything we, we've got this morning. Um, I've had one question of, for clarity coming through. Where does the age of 10 for the cutoff of child inclusive mediation come from as um, this mediator has been doing them from seven years upwards? So just Jane, I just wondered if you've got any comment on that. I have no idea, Mike, actually, but I do know that in the very old days when I was still working as a barrister and when I used to go down to um, the family court um, in London, um, that Kafkas were seeing children uh, then of nine and above at court. And there was a, in the 1990s a sort of a, a rule of thumb that if children were nine or over, they could come to court to express their views to the Kafka's officer, which could then be relayed to the judges. Um, I'm sure there are very few people old enough to remember those days, but um, uh, I don't remember any reason as to why. I suppose it's also in line with the criminal age of responsibility. So whether it's an age that's been chosen um, with that view in mind that it's the age at which a child has enough understanding to know the difference between telling the truth and not telling the truth. Um, but that is all historic and anecdotal knowledge on my part. And I'm sure there are other people present in today's audience who are much, much more um, expert on, on this than me and can probably answer that question. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to bring that. So can we just check, have we got Tracy, Lisa, Robert and Jane all on video? Yep. If you want to have your mics off and on yep. video, that'd be helpful. Yep. Um, I can't see Lisa or Tracy yet, but I'm sure they're I'm here. I'm, I'm here. here. <laughs> really, I'm sure you're here when you start speaking then. Um, so, well, thank you all for, for, for this morning. And if I can ask people to ra raise a hand or, or raise a question, um, I'm happy for people to speak. So, Nancy, your, your, your hand is up first. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Super informative. I'd like to just ask a question about child inclusive mediation, because I am trained, but I would I feel very inequipped to undertake such a task. I think it's it's very it's quite sensitive, could be quite dangerous, and I'm not sure that we have the training, the therapeutic knowledge. Um, and I am especially concerned about that, really. Um, so that was my first point. And my second point, I think, is that's run throughout this morning for me, is that the I'm a mediator and a litigator. Um, I provide both legal services and mediation services. Um, I think the trouble I'm finding is that the those who only do legal work aren't keen on promoting mediation. So, because they're concerned about fees and business targets, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I understand that. And a lot of my Mayams that are referred by solicitors, it's, it's, I have to do, I do the one hour Mayam, but I know more or less that I can't convince that client to go into mediation. Um, so I do wonder if there is any consideration by the FMC for hybrid mediation where lawyers and the participants and the mediator can all work together and we'll keep the system unblocked as best as we can and everybody then benefits. So I would, would, wouldn't mind what other people's thoughts might be. I think, uh, Robert, any, any thoughts on sort of some of those variations in oh, the delivery? That's, that's really kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> <Albert> mediation. <laughs> um, on, the, on, on, on that subject, uh, the uh, easy answer for me is to say it, it it's out of my scope. Uh, if it was a policy decision, it would be something that we would respond to um, and we would absolutely respond to because that is consistent with what I said uh, in, in my talk. 
we see regulation as not just setting sort of basic standards, but as enabling and supporting the profession to move forward. Uh, we don't want regulation to be something which constrains and stops there being uh, development and change. And that's the point about um, hybrid mediation. If it became a significantly valuable policy, then I think it would be the responsibility of the FMC, the FMSB, to think about how the profession could adapt to it. Um, speaking personally, it feels a pretty difficult piece of territory to me because there are some absolutely fundamental differences between uh, the mediatory approach and the lit litigation approach. So uh, if I was to speak as an individual, I would find it very hard to understand how it could take off. Uh, but that's not you know, that's not in my formal hat on, it's just an individual hat on. In, in relation to, uh, just a quick one. Oh, well, yeah, come back on that. Yeah, yeah, come back. Um, uh, so basically what I would say is that there's specific training so that it is extremely well regulated and there's, so that everybody understands, the participants understands their role. So um, you can seamlessly go from facilitative traditional mediation to hybrid if your document agreement to mediate allows that. but every mediator who should be, has to be hybrid trained. Um, and I think that's fundamental to safeguard the principles, professionalism, ethics, et cetera. So I think that there isn't an, a lot of knowledge out there about hybrid mediation, despite Karen Walk and Suzanne Kingston and the whole team doing an amazing job. Um, and I think there are some mediators who are doing hybrid without the training, which is, I find diff very dangerous. But I think there needs to be more awareness about this for the future if we're trying to unblock the court. No, as I say, if, if that becomes something that is important, then absolutely the point you make about there being proper regulation, proper training, proper support is absolutely uh, right. And that's where we should be. We shouldn't be saying, because we don't like the idea of it, we shouldn't do it. Um, we should be seeking to adapt. Now, about just quickly about child inclusive mediation. Again, if the, the, the basic issue about regulation is that we set and seek to monitor and assure fundamental standards. So that's the starting point. But if it becomes clear, and I think you're saying from your point of view, that those basic standards um, aren't sufficient, then we need to think about it in terms of development and improvement as well. Uh, and Mike asked, you know, what are the things that we need to think about? Well, we absolutely need to think about child inclusive mediation. It's, it's on the list. Uh, it goes back to my point about capacity. We're trying to get through things in the most ordered and structured way. And there are things that we know we want to do, but we can't, uh, we can't grapple with. I think we're going to have to, in the next part of the year, I very much think that we're going to have to look at our list of things that we want to do, be much more thoughtful about priorities, discuss more uh, widely with the mediation profession uh, about what those priorities might and could be, and, and then come back with a kind of better, a better sense of priorities and business plan. But I can't make any promises at the moment uh, because it is, you know, there's such a lot to do. Um, I did notice, I think that Adrienne had a, she had a hand up. I don't know how I saw it, but um, she may know more about two of these things than I do. Is she there? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Robert. Um, Hi. I've put my hand down again now, actually, because oh. I know there are a couple, I commented on the chat, but it, it was just to say that obviously it depends, Nancy, what you're talking about in terms of hybrid mediation. Obviously, mediators can, if they feel comfortable, um, do that in terms of invite mediation process. It's still very much not a hybrid, it's just mediation, but it's with solicitors supporting clients. So that does happen now, um, and there's no reason why it can't happen now. But I think that might be different to what you're talking about in terms of hybrid, which I, my understanding is it's a mixture of family and civil models. Um, so again, I think the actual inviting lawyers in and saying, come into the mediation, support your clients, have breakout rooms, give them advice along the way. All of that does happen now um, and it can work really well. Um, you just need to be, all the clients need to be on board, obviously, and the solicitors need to be on board and the mediator needs to be on board. Um, I think, there, I think there's a lot, to... sorry, I think there's a lot 
what I picked out of that actually is that there's a lot of variation in mediators. You get mediators from a legal background who are happy using those kind of tools. You get mediators from a, from from more the social work kind of direction who are probably very happy doing the child inclusive sessions. And it's about using the right skills and the right mediators and working as a collective team on the right case. So I think that's something that had come out through the through the presentations. Um, I want to just move move on and just ask a question to the panel. Um, and it came about from a conversation I had with um, a mediator earlier this week. Is it the use of the word family justice? Should we be using the word family justice um, when we're talking to um, dealing with family breakups? Because justice has very specific meanings and connotations and the way people think of things. So I'd like the panel's view on the use of the word um, family justice. Um, Tracy, maybe. <laughs> yes, I'm just thinking perhaps it ought to be family resolution, didn't it? Um, you know, it's we, whilst we have the power to, um, where when we give an order, we say that if you break this order, because it's an order of the court, and therefore you are in a, a, a um, court situation, you're in a judicial situation, um, then you could be sent to court and sent to prison etc etc but up until that moment we are in a resolution time we are creating a situation where hopefully the child will see both parents at some stage um so yeah it's, I, I agree with you um justice mm -hmm. it is justice let's face it there's there's a number of campaign organizations associated with the family courts that use the word justice in there because they want to get justice and because they feel there's the fault and blame culture there but that's something we need to take out of the court sy system for the benefit of the children and the welfare of the children so yeah family resolution not family justice Okay, um, just remember, remind everyone, if you want to ask a question, if you put your hand up, then we can jump to you. Um, I just wonder if any of the other pan re panel members would like to pick up on that point. I'd like well, to... I thought, sorry. sorry, go on. Oh, just to say that I think this is something that we would like to explore with families when we are undertaking research as part of the two pilots that are taking place in Dorset and North Wales. Because I think the language we use is often the language of uh, of the professionals who work in the system rather than the language that families um, uh, relate to. Um, and certainly in family justice, it's often um, more widely misinterpreted to mean something that doesn't even relate to the family courts. Um, so uh, I, I will happily take that away and think about whether we can incorporate um, some of that into the research that we're currently undertaking. Jane? Yeah, I just thought it was really interesting the reference that Sir Stephen Cobb made to the Alberta um, research and project going on there and how they turned that um, the sort of the, the criticism that there may be a sort of prevention of access to justice by making people jump through hoops was actually about giving people another opportunity, a different um, a pathway to solve things in and um, you know it's looking at the way that other jurisdictions are managing all the same sorts of issues that we are in terms of terminology and how we the sort of um, front that we present uh, and language we use is is very interesting very rich rich uh, source of inspiration. Okay, I'm just going to pick up a message that's come through from, from Mabel. Um, I can't see her. She must be on a somewhere here. Um, about the courts using their... Um, um, asking for the child-inclusive information to be used within the courts. Um, and I just want, wanted to pick up on that. It's about the relationship, I think, between the courts and mediators. What What is privileged? What is private? What is what can be put into the court environment. So I just wanted to pick up, I don't know if, um, if Mabel, you want to add any more to that, but I just think it's quite an interesting dynamic. Just, just to say really that in April, we had four court orders um, ordering that we disclose the views of children that were obtained for the purposes of mediation um, to the court. Um, in three of those cases, the cases were referred to 
child mediation, as they often refer to it, but it actually represented three different courts um, and four different judges. Uh, so, it, you know, it's quite sort of concerning. And in, in one case, the, the court order indicated that the views of children were not privileged um, as part of the process and could be disclosed to the court. And in some ways, I think that the, you know, the way that it kind of appeared was that while well, the court had ordered the parents to attend mediation, albeit voluntary, uh, and that uh, they had effectively sent them to get the children's views obtained because it was going to take far too long for CAFCAS to effectively do their job. So the sort of um, the sense that mediation had really any hope at that point was, you know, they were sent here to get the children's views and now they've got them. They want them to go back to the court. Um, and, you know, we're sort of currently doing uh, grappling with that really locally. Um, you know, I've written to all the judges, but that, you know, nobody kind of gets back to you, do they? And we've written to the sort of local family justice board, but again, no kind of response there. But yeah. it's worrying. It is a worrying fact because, you know, for me, I undertake a lot of sim work with children from six and up. And you know, I don't feel like I can say with any confidence when I'm sat in that, that room talking to parents in that first session that, you know, the children's views are going to be privileged. And when I'm talking to the child about confidentiality, I feel like I don't really feel confident now that I can say, actually, yeah, this is between us. You can choose what's shared and what's not shared. And actually, it's just for the purposes of mum and dad making these decisions. Because yeah, it, it doesn't feel that way. Absolutely. And, and Mabel, I know that you brought this to Helen, uh, Helen Anthony, and she's brought it to me. And I felt extremely concerned just um, on the basis of what you said about the ambiguity in all of this. I'm not quite sure what the regulatory... I mean, obviously, it has an effect on the way in which mediators practice. And therefore, it, we need, the FMSB needs to take cognizance of that and, and decide whether we have a position and how we can deal with it. But it's a very difficult one if there are so varied practices in different courts around the, around the country. Uh, so that joins the list of the many things that we're grappling with at the moment. But I think as we get closer to the courts, we're gonna get more and more examples where those boundaries are blurred a little bit and we, we're going to have to build relationships or and deal with them at the top level as well to ensure everyone knows where the rules are it's the compromise isn't it though in terms of you know because what we do know is that once uh, you know so if if we were to disclose the views of the children um to the to the court um then that then you know there's inevitably you know um the child may be aligned with one parent well very often that's the case as an alignment um, and therefore, you know, you're then drawn into the dispute about taking sides and, you know, the person that conducted that sim will eventually be called to court and, and questioned about, you know, how they conducted the sim, you know, their skill base, that kind of stuff, their background. And then, you know, you've, you've kind of, you know, you've just compromised the entire process. And I suppose my main worry about it was, you know, because on some of those cases, I had this uh, as a mediator, you know, trying to sort of be impartial, but then really see that the children's views perhaps whilst they've been hurt but whilst they've been obtained that perhaps the parents weren't listening to them and that was the reason that they were still you know proceeding with the court process and you know in in two of those cases I thought you know I'd, I'd love to give the court those views because the child will then you know get what he or she says they want yep. you know but equally, I felt like I have a responsibility to the profession, but not just to the children I was working to this particular child or those particular children, but to all other children, like nationally, who I think we would compromise their their right to have their voice heard. Because, you know, I think someone said earlier, you know, there's not uh, as much sim going on as there, there could and should be. And, you know, that is about kind of professional competence and, and confidence. And we need to make sure that people are confident to be able to conduct it. But if we get into a realm of feeling that we're going to be compromised as a profession, yep. if we do that, and it's gonna mean that more and more children aren't heard. Um, and, you know, that's the challenge. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Um, Adrian and Ruth, I was gonna say, are you either jumping in on that point or a new one? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Adrian first and then we'll come to um, Ruth. I was just going to say, I think absolutely what Mabel says is absolutely right. And I think what, in, in my view, what we need to do is really try and address, first of all, training for the judiciary about CIM, because I think there is a clear lack of understanding 
across the boards. Obviously, some individuals know a lot about it and others don't. But I think there needs to be training so that they know what CIM is, how it works, training about mediation and so on. At the moment, obviously, we have our standards and we have our standards in relation to child inclusive work. And it says that obviously those discussions with children are confidential and that isn't perhaps known to the courts. But I think there is the other question, Mabel, that you talk about is actually in some cases, and I certainly have this too, because I see a lot of children, is, oh, if only I could tell the courts what these children are saying, because it would sort things out so quickly um, and I can't. So actually, I just wonder whether there is, um, sorry, Robert, to give you more work <laughs> to give the standards board more work and so on. I wonder oh, whether yeah, we yeah, actually no know <laughs> I wonder whether we need to shift slightly and set up um, another group to look into whether there should be variation on a theme and actually whether there is an alternative to that in terms of reimagining, rethinking, and um, whether we there are some mediations where we might actually know it's not so suitable to share what the children say, but whether there are instances where within our standards, we consider the idea of whether maybe some children's voices should be fed back, could be fed back to the court. Perhaps it shouldn't be black and white. Maybe there's an area of gray that needs to be explored. I don't know what that would look like, but maybe it just needs to be explored. One, one thing that I did sort of uh, make the suggestion when, because we, we're getting, a, you know, lots of people coming asking and one example where CAFCAS had refused to do a section sevens report, they will send them to mediation. Maybe Ledge will do that then. Um, and I think was, was be to look at if we uh, if we ask the parents at the outset to waive the privilege. Um, so if it's clear that, you know, that they're wanting the children's views um, and, it, and it, if, if they're not successful in mediation, that they mean then require them in, in a future so that the child doesn't then have to go back through this process again as well. of Having to meet someone else in the timeline of that going on is that is there an option to um, to waive the privilege? Uh, but the parents signing up to that before they know what the children have got to say, because, of course, uh, once the children have had their views, that's when people often don't really want to know what those things known about. I think, so, I think you're right. I think it's about looking at solutions and, and working ways around. Ruth, I just want to, if, if you can come in on it quickly, because I want to move on to another topic. I just wanted Ruth. to add, really, that whilst the parents might be able to waive their privilege, it, can the children, you know, you're telling a child what you're telling me, if there aren't any safeguarding concerns is between us and you will decide what you feel safe to share, what you want to share, you know, can you take that away from that process? Because if so, maybe it shouldn't be mediation that is doing that child inclusive bit, maybe it should be CAFCAS, because we are, you know, there really as partially as an advocate for that child to have a voice. <clears throat> and if we're sort of kind of muting it already by saying, well, you know, I'm going to share it anyhow if your mum and dad say I can you know that that all our remits that we do in the beginning telling them what how this child mediation is set up is out of the window yeah I because agree I don't have any of that I agree you couldn't um, do that you have right to do that I think, I think have we've to set it up that. in advance I think we've explored that yeah. long enough because I think there's a lot that we can take away and I know it's Robert and I will probably have a conversation about yeah. how that might be discussed further um I just wanted to pick up on Judge Cobb's initial comment or, or end of his presentation. He talked about a wider cultural shift. And I wondered what the panel's thoughts were and what our individual or collective responsibilities are to help that shift actually happen. To, to get more people focusing on, on mediation rather than going through a court process. So um, yeah, I'll just go through um, each of the panel members really to get their views on where we all fit into this. Who wants to go first, Jane? Well, I'll go first, yeah. Um, I, I I think that, I mean, having been in and around the family uh, justice system for more than 40 years now, um, there, there has already been a pretty seismic shift, you know, over the course of my, you know, professional career. Um, but I would say that the acceleration in, in that um, has happened in the last five to 10 years, um, provoked, partly by uh, LASPO and the removal of legal aid um, from, uh, you know, which has prevented many, many people from accessing free mediation and has led to that one third drop off, which from which we've heard from, um, from Elisa, from which we've never recovered. 
Um, and I think that that cultural shift starts at grassroots. It starts with us at a local level. I think um, it, it's it's not doing big things. It's doing little things as much as we can all the time. I think the the wider uh, kind of cultural shift is something that has to happen as an accumulation of lots of small efforts by people as well as by the big efforts at government level. So um, that, that's my sort of my take on it. Okay, um, Tracy. I was on mute. Um, yeah, it needs any cultural shift is challenging. We know that. Um, it's only when things like COVID come on board that you realise how quickly you can actually change your practices. So in some respects, we're in a situation now where we've, it's an ideal time to start to implement more changes and put that push in into the working groups and projects that are happening around the country. The, the you know, um, the committee that um, Justice Cobb sits on now, um, coming out of the, com the working group I was on, um, yeah, it's it's actually saying keep pressurising. So the MA can do that pressure. I guess there's the Mediation Council can make can put that pressure on. Um, ask mediators if you do sit in your local family justice board. It's getting that um, shift, that cultural that talk in the right way, getting the it back into um, use us, don't get not caught first, use the mediators. It's, it's that cultural shift is gonna be challenging, it's gonna be hard. Um, take it away from justice, put it into um, mediation and away from blame and, and um, fault. Okay, um, Lisa? Um. I think if you put yourself in the shoes of families who are separating, then there isn't a system as such that exists at the moment. Um, uh, there's a there's a there's a legal process, there's a court, and there's possibly some alternatives available to you, and possibly not in some places. Um, we don't have a system, and and as Justice Cobb talked about, there needs to be more of an alliance of of different types of services that families could usefully work with to help them through this process. Um, I think a key part of that is to have shared information, shared understanding of uh, each other's services and the needs of those families. And so um, the observatory's own contribution to this is to try to connect this up, to share the information that we can gather across all um, all types of organisations and professionals who come into contact with separating families. And in this space, it's particularly challenging um, because um, many of the organisations who are sources of support for families wouldn't consider themselves part of a, a family justice system, but are as important to those families in terms of resolving their difficulties. Thank you. And Robert, finally. <clears throat> uh, yeah, F uh, culture change, absolutely essential. FMC completely committed to uh, working with the other stakeholders. Justice Cobb mentioned already discussions with CAFCAS. They're in a very, very early stage. But, you know, the idea of SPIPs and early intervention, absolutely supported by the FMC. I see the role of regulation, as you know, to be uh, to enhance, support, engage uh, in that, not in to get in the way. I think that the more difficult thing, well, that's difficult enough, but the even more difficult thing is what can each individual mediator do for, uh, the, for the purpose of developing this cultural shift? What is it that each mediator, everybody on this and webinar, everybody out there, uh, what contribution can he or she make each time they have the opportunity to engage? And I just want to use that as an occasion to bring back my point about the relationship between the individual mediator and the profession you know it seems to me that every uh, that if the profession has a strength of its identity and a direction then what we would like to see is developing mediators who are contributing to the development of that identity so for instance um this business about data and information which have come up absolutely critical that every mediator feels it's uh, the responsibility of them in their work 
to provide the data is going to be helpful. And here's another one. Um, and I'm gonna put this out as an individual, not as a chair of the board, but it seems to me it's a reasonable question to ask to each mediator every time there's a reaccreditation. that's once every three years, what have you done in those last three years to help and support and develop your profession? Not what have you done for your clients or uh, for your business, but what have you done to help and develop your profession? And you might also say, what have you done to help and develop the culture change that we need? Now I put that out, uh, it's not something that is official policy, but it's something that I think is worth asking uh, as we go forward. Thank you. I think that's a really probing question that we all should ask ourselves every day in whatever world we work in. Um, I've got a question from Tony Wood. Is Tony there? Uh, yes, the, the moment's passed. Uh, we've gone off the subject, so don't worry Great. about it. Uh, Sorry, it's just, to keep it keeping focus on so many different things. Sorry, I missed I that. Absolutely fine. Okay, then. Well, I've got no other questions there. Has anyone got any questions before we sign off for the morning? In that case, um, I'd like to thank the speakers from this morning. I think there's been a really in-depth look at the world that we work in and the political world that we work in and how all that's going to impact on how we work individually. Um, I know over my last sort of the two years I've been working in the mediation world, we've stepped up to try and do everything we can to help push the, the, the sector forward. Um, so we've been doing training media magistrates, training CAB staff and doing those kind of things to help raise that profile. And I think it's something that we've all got to step up and do because otherwise we're just going to get to a point where um, people will get, don't understand what we do. They can't, if they don't understand it, they can't get people to adopt mediation as their first choice going forward. So we've got to make sure they understand as a first point of call and they know who to call. So that's where we come from. Um, so Ruth, I see your hand popped up. Yeah, I think we need to be aware that not just professionally do we need to collaborate, we need to educate the public. And that goes to how do we access the people that actually need to know that information. We can have all of those collaborations in place, but if the public don't know where their first point of access is, that doesn't help anybody. We, we can have a great system behind it, but the public need to know where their first point of access is to get a triage of information rather than going to a solicitor and being given a one dimensional response often um, and taking them down that legal path. And it's the public education. And it, it's been that for, you know, for many, many years. And even when the Mayan first came along and mediation, that public awareness, we just don't, we haven't got. And I think the trouble is people need mediation or they go through a separation once they never they know nothing about it until they need it and they need it very quickly and everyone their initial thought is phone solicitor up that's where I start and or somebody mentioned the the front. clients end up with huge thousands of pounds worth of legal fees and no further forward and not understanding that there were other options to them um, yeah. saying, you know, you need somebody like a separation hub to say these are all the services that you can access. What do you need right now? Do you need some relationship counselling? Do you need healthy separation? Do you, do you need a, se a separated parenting course? Do you just need some parenting help? Is it just all created by child conflict? Don't know. Let somebody sit above all of that and then move these people to where they need to go. But that's public awareness um, yep. of those things. So that, that was my point. OK, well, th thank you. And I think I think it's a very good point to end on. It, it is the job we've got to do is raise the public awareness and keep raising it because we raise it today and we get the people moving on to mediation who need it today. But next month, there's a whole group of new people who have never come across it before. So we just keep that message going forward. So, um, well, I'd like to just finish by thanking all, all the speakers um, for their time in getting prepared and delivering really helpful and informative presentations. So thank you.